Happy New Year to you. Let's pick up right where we left off in the last video at the end of last year. I'm sorry that this one got delayed. I managed to catch COVID, but don't worry, I'm not dead. I've recovered, so let's get back to it. So in the last video, we discussed using the flywheel approach to improve your trading. And I said that in this video, I'd explain an important part of my trading that will then help you to understand in the next video how you'll be able to massively improve your trade entries continuously in just three steps. So you probably know by now if you've been watching this channel for a while that I trade using the Duomo method. And people often ask me what type of trading the Duomo method actually is. Is it price action, technical analysis, pattern trading, swing trading, scalping? How do I define it? So essentially it's based on technical analysis, but I'd say the most accurate way I can describe it is that it's context-based trading formed from the Duomo market theory. So in this video, I'm going to explain what I mean by context-based trading, and I'll explain it in a way that means that you can apply it to your trading, whether you're using the Duomo method or something completely different. And to make it easier to understand, I've actually broken the video up into chapters that outline some of the key beliefs I have about trading that then make the context-based approach much more straightforward for you to understand. So let's get started. The way I look at trading is that when we take actions in the market, we're making a statement about something. Even if we choose to do nothing, to take no action in the market, if we make a decision to do that, we're making a statement in one way or another. Now, the problem I see for many traders is that they may have a particular view about something, but the action that they take in the market is making a very different statement to the view that they have. And in most cases, traders wouldn't even realize that that's the case. So let me give you a really straightforward example of what I mean with this. And we'll use investing for this example rather than trading because that way it's easier for everyone to understand and to relate to regardless of what method of trading you use for yourself. So imagine at the start of 2020, your friend invests in a cruise company before the pandemic begins they would have been making some form of statement by making that investment. Now, assuming it wasn't some sort of hedge or something like that, but just a standalone investment, they're basically saying, I'm going to put some money into this company because I feel it will outperform the market as a whole. And if they analyzed other assets, you could argue that the statement is also that they think it will outperform any other assets, at least on a risk adjusted basis. Now, because of this statement, when minor negative news hits the market, they see that it hasn't materially changed anything in the company and therefore doesn't change their thoughts on that investment. They still feel that the company is going to outperform the rest of the market and therefore they hold on. So far, their thoughts match the statement they're making with their actions. But then the pandemic starts to take hold. And if you remember, we had that issue right at the start of the pandemic with the Princess Cruise Liner, and this led to cruise companies going into a bit of a meltdown. So there was a material impact to the valuation of those companies because the industry had changed. On top of that, from a more macro point of view, there were discussions around the world that countries were going to start restricting travel and some were potentially going into lockdown. So there was this expectation from just about everyone that things were going to get worse before they'd have a chance to get better. So imagine at that point in time, you ask your friends again what they're going to do about their cruise liner investments. And they tell you, I'm going to hold on because the price is down a lot at the moment and it's likely to go back up eventually. Now that's a very common thing that people do and it's usually due to loss aversion. In fact, some traders suddenly become investors when a position they have is down and they decide to hold on until it comes back into being a profit. But now, what does that statement they're making with their actions actually say? And does it match their decision making? The way I see it is that the statement they're making by being invested in that company still is that this asset is likely to outperform the market or at least outperform other assets that they could invest in. And if they didn't believe that was the case, if they didn't think it was going to outperform, why would they leave their money there? Why not take their money and invest it in something they, they think is going to perform better? Now, of course, behavioral economics and things like that can explain why someone might be doing something like this, but that's not what I'm interested in for now. I'm just interested in what statements are being made by the actions we take in the market. You see, your friend thinks that the price will go up eventually, but so what? 
Is it going to outperform? Because otherwise, why have more of your money at risk? Why not take that opportunity cost of having your money tied up in that investment and invest it into something that's going to perform better? You know, if they don't think that this is going to outperform the market as a whole, why not take your money and invest it in something like an index tracker or just something else? Now, I know some of you might argue against that specific example and think that it's flawed in some way, but the example is less important than the point that I'm trying to explain, and I'm sure you follow what I mean with it. So, as you gain more experience as a trader or investor, and as you improve your skills, you achieve two things. On one hand, you improve your perception and ability to read the markets so that the statements that you make with your actions are more likely to lead you to success. And on the other hand, you reduce the gap between your actions and your thoughts so that the things that you do in the market actually reflect the statements that you're intending to make. There's less unintended divergence. What I see many traders doing and being taught to do is something that we'll refer to as setup based trading. So this means they identify a setup that meets particular criteria they have for entering a trade and they open that trade. They then have a stop loss and often a take profit or target level that are based on the levels they see as being important at the point of entering the trade. So, so far so good, right? They've got a reason for entering the trade, they've got a reason for choosing those levels. And for many traders, this is exactly how they'll trade. They open a trade at the setup, decide to take profit, decide the stop loss, and then just let the trade play out. Now, with this sort of setup based trading, what statements are being made? Well, the statements basically are that there's a reason for me taking this trade, and there's a reason for my profit target and stop loss being where they are, and there's nothing between opening my trade and reaching one of those levels on either side that will change anything. Therefore, those are the levels that I'm going to stick to. For example, I'll see people that are trading some sort of chart pattern and they'll be setting a profit target based on fading the entire move back and looking for a 7 to 1 trade. And they're basically saying there's nothing that can happen between the setup, my entry point, and the profit target that can change my rationale for opening or holding this trade. Now, if you ask them what could change the situation between their entry points and their profit target, they'll be able to tell you many things that could disrupt the trade, many reasons to not hold on anymore. But somehow, this is not reflected in the way they're approaching their trade. Instead, they traded the setup, they decided the levels at the time of opening the trade, and they're letting it ride out regardless of what happens next. Likewise, when the price does reach their profit target and they exit their trade in a profit, by taking that action, they're also making a statement. They're making a statement that the probability of the price continuing for them and building more profit is no longer high enough for them to want to stay in the trade. But surely that's not something that you could have decided at the point of entry. Surely that's something you can only decide then and based on some new analysis. In other words, the context of the situation may have changed since their entry and that calls for further analysis. This is why I take a different approach. The individual price movements that happen in the market are never something that we can just assess in isolation. Like for example, you could look at a bullish price move of 100 pips on the same asset happening on two completely different days. Okay, so two different days, same asset, each time it's a 100 pip move. And those moves will not have the same meaning. Despite them being the same distance, the same asset, they still won't have the same meaning. Why? Because we also need to look at the context that those movements happened in. Let's give you a very extreme example. We had many 100 pip moves in both directions when the volatility in the markets was at its highest during the start of the pandemic. But those 100 pip moves would be very different to a sudden 100 pip move happening during a relatively tame and calm time in the markets. Like for example, if the price suddenly spikes due to a surprise in an important economic data release. So the meaning we get from these different price moves of the same distance in the same asset are different. The context of the situation matters. Now the context can be determined in many different ways and it depends on the method that you're trading and what information is important to you. 
So with the Dwoa method, we look at things like the structure and the path of least resistance based on significant levels, which helps us to determine the context from a technical point of view. And then we can also combine this with the fundamentals to get a much better outlook of what's happening. And by the way, if you do want updates on financial news, fundamental analysis, and our opinions on that sort of thing, then make sure you check out our second channel that we launched at the end of last year. It's called Market Movers and it's linked up here. Anyway, back to the point of the video, at any point in time, there are different contexts at play. Because if you think about it, it depends largely on what time horizon you're looking at. Even markets that are in long-term decline will have some bullish periods, or vice versa, if markets in a bull market, it can still have pullbacks. There are many different contexts at play on different time horizons and so on. Now, basically, Every second of time that passes, every pip the price moves, every new bit of information that hits the market, the context of the situation is changing, slightly. Now, sometimes these incremental changes won't be important at all. It doesn't change the context in a material way. But at other times, it can change it significantly. For example, the price might move five pips and mean absolutely nothing, it's unimportant, but at another point in time, same market, it might move five pips and be showing us something important. Maybe it's breaking through a significant level at the close of an hour that would completely change the context of the market. Or maybe it's based on some new information and it changes the way that you're going to look at things. And so the actions that I'm taking with my trades, whether that's closing the trade, scaling in, scaling out, or even deciding to stay in the trade and do nothing, because that's still an action I'm taking and a decision I've got to make, all of this is based on those significant changes in the context. So what this means is that although I do need a setup to enter the trade, the setup is not dictating the entire trade. The setup is just giving me the right timing. It's showing me that there's a reason to be in a position right now based on the combination of the risk, return, and probability of a potential outcome that may play out. Which brings me on to the next chapter, potential outcomes. For this one, let's go and jump into the charts so I can show you there. So what we've been saying so far is that there are a number of different potential outcomes that could play out in the market. A lot of traders only ever think about just two of those. The one where the price moves against them and hits their stop loss and the one where it hits their take profit level. But instead, there are many potential outcomes. And with a context-based approach, we're making decisions and taking actions based on moments that either do or have the potential to change the context. So the best way to explain this with an example, we're going to imagine that we have this really simple way of trading. Now, I wouldn't recommend actually using this approach to trading as it's not realistic, but you can follow the same principles of what we're doing with whatever the relevant factors are in your own approach to trading. Again, it's not the actual example that's important here, but the principles we're following. So basically, in this simple approach, we're going to trade based on the structure of the market using the highs and lows. If there are lower highs and lower lows, we're in a bearish trend. And if there are higher highs and higher lows, we're in a bullish trend, very simple. And if there's a mix, like if there's a higher high after a lower low or vice versa, we'd be waiting for the next high or low to confirm what direction the structure is going in. So in that case, if we're going long, we're making a statement that we believe there will be a bullish trend based on these factors that we've discussed. And if we're going short, we'd be making a statement that we think that there's a bearish trend, that the bearish trend will continue. And if we're closing a position, it would be a statement that the chances of that trend ending are high enough that we should no longer be in the trade. So here's the chart we'll use for our example. And as you can see with this US dollar yen chart, we're in a bearish trend because there are lower highs and lower lows. Now imagine, in our simple way of trading, all these highs and lows can be marked up with horizontal levels. And we know that when the price reaches one of these highs or lows, it can either break through it or it can reverse at it. But whatever outcome occurs, that price will just keep going until it reaches the next high or low, as there are no other factors that determine the context in this imaginary market. And therefore, there's nothing else that's important to us. So if the price 
reverses at the level, it's going to continue until it encounters the next level. If it breaks through, it will continue until it reaches the next level in that direction as well. So that means that all of our trading decisions in this imaginary situation are going to be determined based on these highs and lows. So there are only really three possible contexts for the market. Either it's in a bull trend, a bear trend, or it's mixed. So imagine the price is at this level here and we're deciding whether we want to trade it or not. Let's go through the potential next outcomes. What could happen next? Well, we know that really the price is only going to either move up or move down. But if it does move up or down from here, it's confirming something about the reaction to that level because it means it's either breaking the level or reversing at it. And since we know the price will continue to the next level that it encounters, it means we can now map two potential outcomes, outcome one and outcome two. These are our first level outcomes. Now, based on this, what else would I need to know to open a trade? Well, I'd need to have an expected probability of each of these outcomes happening. I can see that outcome two has more potential pips of profit than outcome one. So if the probability of that one occurring is good enough, it's likely that I'd want to trade outcome one. But now, where would I want to put a stop loss and where would I close my trade if it moves into profit? If we were going short, traders who use a setup based approach to trading would place their stop loss based on outcome one happening and their take profit level would be based on outcome two happening. Now, that might end up being a decent trade. But if you're already thinking ahead while I'm explaining this and you keep in mind the things that we've already discussed throughout this video, you might already be able to start to see how that approach isn't necessarily the best approach to take. You see, we can actually think beyond the first level outcomes. So let's think what would happen next in either situation. If outcome one happens, either the price will break through the next level or it will reverse at that next level. So now we have outcome 1A and outcome 1B. And if outcome 2 happens, we have the same. So it's either outcome 2A or outcome 2B. So now before we even enter our trade, we already have a range of different potential outcomes that could occur. And this is just thinking about the next two moves. You know, if we think beyond that, we can think of even more, but that's probably not necessary for now. Right now we have just a few different outcomes that may play out next and those may change whether we want to stay in a trade or not, whether we want to open a trade in the first place. For example, let's say that we open a trade and we want to exit after outcome two has happened and we're in a short trade. Why would we want to exit there if there's still the potential for outcome two B to happen? So how do we decide what to do? Well, we match our actions to the potential changes in context. It's context-based trading. We can think of it like this table here. We have the potential outcome, what it would suggest about the context, and therefore what action would be appropriate to take after the outcome. So you can see after outcome one, we have a higher high, but there's still a chance that we could end up having a, a lower low afterwards. So there's no need to take a loss there. Maybe you choose to scale out instead or just hold on for a bit longer. But if outcome 1A happens, there's now a higher chance that the next low will be a higher low, which means that we'll be in a bullish trend. So we would want to exit if outcome 1A starts happening. We wouldn't want to have anything else at risk. And on the other hand, if we look at outcome 2A, there's now a higher low. But we might not want to exit the trade yet because if there's a lower high, if it fails at that level and reverses, we may still be in bearish context and we could end up with much more profit. So maybe we just want to scale out instead because there's a higher risk, a higher chance of the, the price moving against us. So in other words, the actions we're taking are matching a statement we're making about the context of the situation at that point in time, according to whatever method we use to analyze the markets. If you use a different approach to trading, there'll be other levels or other bits of information that help you to determine the context. And there might be many different contexts that matter to you, but your actions should be matching a statement you're making about that context and not just opening and closing a trade at arbitrary points in time. But now you might be looking at this example and thinking to yourself, well, if you've had outcome two happening, you wouldn't know whether it's going to be outcome 2A or 2B until it's too late, until that move has happened. So how will you know which action you need to take?
Now, remember, with your method of trading, or if you're using the Duomo method, there will be other factors that change the context for you or that you have to pay attention to. It's not going to be as straightforward and one-dimensional as this example that we're going through. Trading at the end of the day is a complex skill, so there are always going to be complexities. People try to oversimplify trading by creating these really, really basic rules to follow, but that doesn't necessarily treat trading as a skill in the way that it is. Instead, just like any other complex skill, the way it becomes simple for you is through you practicing, gaining experience and getting better at it, not by you trying to oversimplify it just with the aim of making it something that's easy to do. That isn't how you succeed in any skill, let alone trading. But anyway, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Let's continue with this example. You see, the thing that's missing so far is the probability of each outcome happening. So when you're entering the trade, you might think in this situation, for example, that there's a 50-50 chance of outcome one and outcome two. So at that point in time, there's a lower probability of the other next level outcomes happening because you don't even know the first level outcome yet. But even so, some of those will still be more likely to happen than others. The probabilities will all be different. Now, I mentioned earlier that every pip the price moves and every second of time that passes, the context is always ever so slightly changing. But sometimes a small change can mean nothing and sometimes a small change can make a big difference in the context, depending on when and where it happens. So for example, at our point of entry, if the price starts breaking through the level, moving up, is confirming that outcome one is playing out. And at the same time, it's confirming that outcome two is not playing out. So at that point in time, the probability of outcome two, 2A and 2B occurring is continuing to reduce. What this means is that we could almost have a table like this, where next to each of the potential outcomes, in one column, we could have the things that could happen that would reduce the probability of that outcome occurring, and in the other column, we could have things that increase the probability of that outcome occurring. This means that we're already outlining that there are different things that could happen that would give us a sign that one outcome is or isn't likely to happen. It's increasing or reducing the probability of those outcomes. In other words, we're looking for confirming or disconfirming evidence of each of those outcomes occurring by what happens in the markets. So if we think back to earlier on when we had the example of the cruise company, maybe when the Princess Cruise Liner had to be quarantined, that's a sign that the probability of the cruise company immediately outperforming the market that year is reducing. That may or may not mean that it's time to scale out of the position or to close it, but if it isn't, later on when countries started implementing travel bans and others were on the horizon, that might push the probability even lower of it outperforming that year, so that when you look at the risk and reward of the situation, it's no longer viable to stay in the trade. So the probability of negative potential outcomes is outweighing the probability of the positive potential outcomes, and so given the risk and reward involved, you might choose to be out of the position. So if we go back to our chart example here, maybe we can add an extra element of complexity. We can add paths of resistance, that as well as the structure in the market, there are certain paths of resistance. And so maybe there's a point on the chart where there is a path of resistance that we identify. So if we move through that path of resistance, now maybe the chances of outcome two playing out are reducing because there's an extra factor that's giving us evidence to rule out that outcome. There's an extra obstacle for that one to occur. So the probability of it occurring has reduced. Now, you might hear that and think, well, that sounds a little bit complicated to me. But think of it this way. When you have criteria to open a trade, what you've basically done is identified evidence that for whatever reason, you think the probability is high enough that a certain outcome is going to happen. If you have criteria that give you the signs to enter a short trade, that's because you found evidence that you believe a bearish move is going to happen or that the probability of a bearish move happening is high enough for you to open a trade. So we're essentially doing that, but we're just looking at factors that confirm or disconfirm potential outcomes having the possibility of occurring and we're making actions based on that. So what this all leaves us with is a situation where our next decision points and our next actions in the market are crystal clear 
because we know what actions we'll take in the market. That's always going to be based on an outcome changing the context in some way. And we know when our next decision point for that action will be because even though the context changes slightly every pip the price moves or every second of time that passes, we know that certain actions have to occur to confirm or disconfirm each potential outcome. So we don't need to take an action until one of those things happen. Therefore, overall, the statements that we make through our actions in the market are aligned with our views on the context of the market and the probability of things continuing in our favor or not. All right, I'll be honest with you. I only put this video together for you because I promised in the last video that I would and because it will make the next video easier to explain and clearer for you to understand. However, it wasn't until I started actually working on this video that I quickly realized this is one of the most difficult things I've tried to condense down into such a relatively short amount of time while still trying to keep things clear and easy to follow and understand. Because this is a topic that usually when we go through it, it's much longer, we need more time to explain it, more examples, and a bit more of interaction and Q&A to make sure that it's really learned properly. So I do know that there'll be many of you who weren't ready for this information because you're too early into your trading journey, or are just generally confused by parts of it. And that's okay, don't be disheartened by that. In reality, it's more simple than it seems. And I really believe whether you trade based on fundamentals or any type of technical analysis approach to trading, a context-based approach is the correct way to approach your trading. Now, I will elaborate on these things and break them down, and break down these different concepts in future videos. But if any of this has confused you, rewatch it first of all. It might help seeing it for a second time and you know, focusing on one particular part and think how it may apply to the method of trading that you use and if you still don't get it, ask the questions that you need to ask in the comment section and we'll try and help you out. Maybe we could do an extra video on those things. Now, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next video in the series. And don't forget about our second channel that I mentioned earlier, Market Movers, for updates on the financial news and fundamental analysis. And of course, in the next video on this channel, I'll be explaining how you take the things that you learned in this video and in the last video on the flywheel approach and bring them all together to improve your trade entries massively on a continuous basis in three steps. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in that one. Take care.